Hello everybody. I'm playing with junk again and this time I literally pulled this unit here from the junk bin or from the recycling bin to be a little bit more precise. It's an IBM 9729 optical wavelength division multiplexer and what that is I will explain you in this video. On this unit you have 10 input modules here. You can have different modules this one is equipped with ESCON uh, interfaces, that's a IBM standard interface for mainframes. You can also have um, Ethernet or FDDI interfaces. ESCON for example is 200 megabit per second on two fibers. So if you, we take out this plug here, you see it has two uh, covers for a receiver and a transmitter laser and then we also have 10 laser cards one for each channel so the signal goes in here into the laser card and then the magic thing happens a multiplexer is something that puts several data lines or well, whatever lines, video, uh, speech, telephones, together into one line. And that's exactly what this thing does, but it does it on a purely optical uh, way. Here is a very crude uh, drawing about what a multiplexer is doing. It has multiple input and output lines, and it puts the signals together to use only one line for transmitting and then on the other side you have the same uh, device that takes everything apart and makes in this case 10 individual data lines from the multi-line stream. Uh, there are several different ways to do that. One is for example time division multiplexing so you send a small chunk of every uh, input line to the output line and you're switching so fast okay the racers are on the road and you're switching so fast that it looks like all 10 uh, input lines go over one line in the same moment but that's not true and in this case they do it with different wavelengths of light. You can put different wavelengths into one fiber and then on the other end you separate them with an optical trick. Okay, so let's see what's inside this box. We have 10 identical or 9 identical input cards. They look like this. They have a standard uh, input output laser module from Hewlett Packard in an IBM device that's interesting and well there is not uh, it doesn't change the signal so if there is a video signal coming in it puts out the video signal at the end if there is FDDI Ethernet depending on the card with different uh, connectors here it doesn't change the data it does only that multiplexing so the optical input here will be converted into digital electrical data and then it will be sent to a corresponding laser card that's the card here and you can see there is a transmitting laser module here ok 
can even see the part number. You can find this device. There are even data sheets available. It's made by Alcatel. It's a two and a half gigabit per second uh, laser transmission module. It has an output uh, power of 20 milliwatts. And as you can see, there is the white fiber coming from that. And there's also a yellow fiber that goes into this module. I didn't find any information about that, but I think it's, a, it's the receiver. And for some reason it is powered with up to 400 volts. Too bad that I didn't find a data sheet, so that would be an, exp uh, an interesting thing to know why it needs such a high voltage. Um, there is also something a round object from Avantech. So uh, my best guess is that's uh, an oscillator, some kind of. And here on the disc cover, there is another oscillator. And interestingly, is this sticker here tells us it's the card B10, which is also labeled on the front. So they are A1 to 10 cards and B1 to 10 cards. Uh, the A cards are all in one unit and the B cards are in the other unit. So you need a receiver and a transmitter or maybe better two transceivers. And my best guess is 1585, uh, 58, that's uh, the wavelength, 1558 nanometers. Because the laser is in the 1500 nanometer range and each card needs a different wavelength. So there is probably some sort of oscillator that influences the wavelength or it's just a label for the card because the B9 card for example has 1556 so it's two nanometers away let me see the next card should be 1554 yes it's true the B8 card so each one of these cards has a separate uh, order number, so if you need a replacement, you have to say that you need the B8. I think the A8 card is identical because it's bi uh, bidirectional, so it doesn't matter which card goes where, but it is important that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is in the right order because if you change cards uh, then probably uh, the data stream from card 8 will be received well of course by card 8 but if that card is in a different slot it will probably receive nothing or it puts the data stream to the wrong port then there is of course a controller card with a microprocessor but there is not too much microprocessing power here. It's a Philips small microcontroller that the max uh, 235, that's probably the interface for the serial port here, that can be used to set up and manage the whole thing. Well, there is not much processing power because the unit doesn't uh, work with the actual data. It, this, this card is only for controlling temperatures, fans, power supply and telling that everything is okay or not. And finally, oh, let's put them here. We have another large card that's the tech controller card 
thermoelectric cooling and that sounds interesting and you will see shortly what it does. The last card that is interesting is the output card. So these are all input cards. What well, I call it inputs is all it is always bi bidirectional, so it's input and output in the same time. Here we have two outputs to this single fiber where all the uh, signals from the inputs are multiplexed. We have a primary and a secondary. This is not receive and transmit. It's receive and transmit on the primary and also on the secondary because you can use a fiber, a glass fiber, to transmit data in both directions. So if you, it's like a window, uh, light goes through in either direction, it doesn't matter. So you can also use one fiber for receive and transmit. And the reason why we have two outputs here is we have here an optical relay. It has one input here and it has two outputs on this side and they are simply switching a movable fiber from one port to the other or maybe they do it with a mirror, I don't know. And that's just for redundancy in case that one signal is lost, it switches to the second port, to a redundant fiber, and tries to communicate uh, through that fiber. So that's all what this card is doing. There's not much about it. There's a part number, if you want to Google that. Yeah, optical relay. Also an interesting thing. By the way, you may probably have noticed that the fibers, the yellow and the white here, are also going to that multi-connector here. So you have all kind of connections that are possible. You have the standard uh, electrical connections, you have coaxial connections four times, and you also have these fiber connectors which are spring-loaded. They connect into the back plane and transmit the optical signal from the card to the back plane. And speaking about the back plane, here it is. Uh, the only thing missing are the power supplies. They are connected on these four uh, big connectors here. Uh, they run the whole unit runs on plus minus five and plus minus eight and a half volts with uh, currents of 30 or 40 amps per power supply. So it draws quite a bit of uh, energy. I mean the lasers alone are 20 milliwatt, milliwatt per laser. So, and well, the efficiency is not too good. So there is a black and red cable that goes up to this unit here. It has three times black and red. We will see what's inside just a little bit later. Before that, we have a look at the back plane. And you see the white coaxial cables that go from the input cards to the laser cards, it's four cables per card pair. Then we have the optical connectors. Let me see how they work. They, oh, they can be plugged out like that. So we have 20 inputs and 20 outputs. I'm not sure which is which and they are all labeled. Let's fly through the wires. You can see the label 20, 19, 17, 18. So the even numbers are 
in the upper row, the odd numbers are in the lower row. And there is one fiber, number zero, going to our output card here. So it's the same kind of connector. So we have 20 wires going into this and one wire coming back. So now what's the magic inside this metal box here? The wires come together in this tube here are routed around. Oops camera cable is in the way and go into this white box here let's see what's inside this box well not too much it's just the storage compartment for the pigtails that's how this wire ends are called because they are curled like a pigtail and then they exit that box and go into the metal box here. Now I can show you the disassembly of the metal box because there is a very nasty foam inside. This is a 20 year old machine. The foam is totally falling apart but I had a second machine and I will show you now what's inside the box and I think you will be surprised. And inside the box without the aluminium case and all the nasty foam is basically this. It's a yellow golden uh, aluminium tube. The flat ribbon cable here that's only, that's not a, a data cable, that's a thermal sensor here. There is another thermal sensor here glued to the case and a third thermal sensor here. I don't know why they need so many wires for one thermal sensor. Maybe there are a couple of thermal sensors in one case. There is a special chip here, or maybe not so special. Oh, let me remove that. So you can see this. I think I see Dallas. Is that right? Yes, it's a Dallas chip. Uh, DS1620. That's certainly a, a thermal, uh, thermal. Um, how do you call that? Uh, sensor. And they routed all the pins, all the connections into that. Uh, flat cable here. The same on this side. It has a little bit heat shrink tube around. Maybe we can remove that. Well, it's certainly exactly the same. Yeah. And there is a third one which is hanging out uh, of the case to measure the air temperature around the unit. So two are inside the unit, one is flapping in the breeze outside the unit. And what's left is a thermoelectric cooler or three of them with a heatsink. There is a fan blowing air through that heatsink. We have three individual thermoelectric cooler and you can see how the foam has uh, eaten on the aluminium, it has corroded the aluminium, it, it's really dusty and not very nice to touch, so that's why I didn't uh, disassemble this one in front of the camera, because I don't want the mess here in the lab. Cooler, and it is directly attached to this uh, unit here just a tube with 21 fiber cables 
going in and out. And what I removed here is the original uh, part label. The type is a WDM20 waveform uh, domain multiplexer, or how do I call that? Uh, sorry, wavelength division multiplexer 20. Uh, SM stands for short, uh, no, that would be short wave. I don't know. I didn't find a data sheet, but well, this unit is from mid 1990, so it's 20, more than 20 years old. It's a little bit difficult. And now, finally, let's see what's inside this unit. A big, massive crystal glass thing. Okay, I made a few shots under the microscope. Maybe you can see a little bit closer what it is. There are the fibers going in. Input, 20 fibers in, one fiber out. And there are fibers that are cut away, so it seems this unit is built to for more fibers, but they only needed 21, so they simply cut a couple of them away inside the unit. So you can see that. The fibers are then glued to this glass support structure here. And then underneath the clear glass here, you can probably see right in the center here, where it looks a little bit different, there are these 21 fibers without the insulation, of course. The, f the glass fibers themselves are extremely thin, so that's only a protection here. Camera focus please. So that protection ends here, you can see that, and then maybe we can also, so okay I show you the pics from the microscope, then you can see the fibers going in onto that black part here, which is probably something like a comb. Uh, fibers in the center. Now you can see them where that's the spot where it is a little bit darker in the center and they end in the hole. You can see in this angled mirror here which is not a mirror it's an optical grating. An optical grating is a very fine pitched uh, well not a grid uh, well be, it may be a grid it's the same effect as on a CD. If you hold a CD against the light, you see all kinds of colors. That's because the CD has very fine uh, grooves um, where the data is stored and that acts as an optical grating. Now this is in an angle and then on the other side we have a mirror. Underneath that black protection coating is a gold mirror. Maybe we can see that. Well, the problem is the glass is not clear. It's not polished on the side. But I think, well, if we could see inside here. Yeah, you see some reflections. And the whole thing I'm not sure if I can explain how it works, but it works more or less like a prism. A prism that is used to dissect white light into its different colors. You get the, this typical rainbow uh, as an output. And it can also be used to combine different colors into a white uh, mixture of colors. And that's exactly what this thing here is doing. 
there's one beam going in the mirror here is not flat it's a little bit curved so it uh, probably moves the light in different directions and somehow they are picked up by the individual uh, fibers here uh, depending on the wavelength and well it's complicated but I think it really looks beautiful and it's totally passive there is no active electronics here it's just a piece of glass and mirrors and optical know-how so what I think it's interesting is this cut it looks like the entire thing has been twisted a little bit maybe that's an adjustment that is necessary so they probably make this part then they make this part they put it together and they adjust it until it works so that's a very first version of this uh, wavelength uh, multiplexing so today it will probably be smaller with maybe with shorter wavelengths or whatever okay that's it thanks for watching